This evening, we have a special report and a roundtable discussion to cover the coronavirus or COVID-19 right here on CNA TV. As many are aware, coronavirus has been labeled as a global pandemic. As of Monday morning, at least 22 people have died from the virus in the United States. 19 in Washington State, 2 in Florida, and 1 in California. The Washington State deaths include 16 linked to the Life Care Center nursing home. The nursing home is known as the location where the outbreak began in the United States. At least 565 people in the U.S. have tested positive for coronavirus, including 70 people who were repatriated to the U.S. Worldwide, the number of deaths has topped 3,500, with more than 105,000 people infected. Nations are restricting travel, specifically Italy, virtually shutting down all travel in their northern region. Global markets have tumbled, with the Dow reporting record dips almost daily as governments around the world take increasingly stringent measures to try to slow the outbreak. And even Dublin has canceled their St. Patrick's Day parade due to the virus. Politically, a U.S. federal government that has been legislatively fractured on almost every issue has passed the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2020 in overwhelmingly bipartisan fashion to fund $8.3 billion for coronavirus relief. This all happened last week in just three days. It was introduced in the House and passed on Wednesday, moved quickly through the Senate 96 to 1 on Thursday and signed by President Trump on Friday morning. Coronavirus has received the world's attention, and for those working and living in nursing homes, this is no different, especially as the elderly are incredibly susceptible to the virus. We'll give you our expert opinion, data, and resources in our special report roundtable next. <music> This is a CNA TV special report sponsored by Northern Light Health. Good evening and welcome to our special report. This roundtable is sponsored by Northern Light Health. I'm your host, Dane Henning. I'm with Long-Term Care News, and I would like to introduce now our panel. First is Lisa Sweet, the co-founder and chief clinical officer of the National Association of Healthcare Assistants. She is an RN and previously a director of nursing. She was recently interviewed by a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Peter Warwinski of the Washington Post, and as several uh, other uh, organizations on coronavirus. Actually, you've also been uh, quoted in, uh, in India News outlet, is that true? Yes, yeah? yes. Okay. And to my right is Lisa Hauk, who covers sales and marketing for the association. She was previously in the hospital setting where she was responsible for flu vaccinations for all of Northwestern Arkansas. Welcome, Lisa and Lisa. I appreciate the time. Um, let's start off the question. I think this is really the most important question or the at least what people are really talking about. Is, is this whole thing really a big deal or are people just overreacting, Lisa? Well, it depends on who you ask, actually. I know mm -hmm. that sounds like a ridiculous answer. Sir, but um, I get my information from the CDC, Centers mm -hmm. for Diseases Control and Prevention, mm -hmm. uh, cdc.gov, if anybody wants to look them up. They've got great information on coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, there I go touching my face. The thing <laughs> seems like when you are told not to touch your face, that's all you want to do is touch your face. Touch your face. Um, and I also get information from CMS, Centers mm -hmm. for Medicare and Medicaid Services, because they have some great resources on what we can do to protect ourselves as healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. It's not like we can work from home. Exactly. Like, wouldn't that be nice if yeah. we could? <laughs> um, so. Uh, yes, it, according to these credible sources and according to my professional opinion of 30 plus years in nursing, this is a big deal. We're, we're talking about a brand new virus that's in humans. They call it the novel coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Novel means new. Um, this strain of co coronavirus has not been detected in humans before. There's been similar strains, and that's where we're getting some of our information is how those other coronavirus strains have behaved. But this is brand new for the human population and a um, little bit frightening, yes. So you mentioned the utilizing the, C, the CDC. Mm -hmm. You know, with a lot of misinformation in today's social media, um, it's very easy to misinterpret, to have fake news, et cetera, right. et cetera. Um, what, is the CDC a good method to be able to fact check and make sure that you are actually receiving the proper information? Oh, absolutely. 
Um, the CDC is actually working hand in hand with state and local governments, oh. uh, local health departments even. And so looking at your local or state health department, the CDC, or if you're working in or have a, lo a loved one in a nursing home or another healthcare setting, uh, the CMS website is also a, a great source for information. I don't know why some news outlets are motivated at creating um, pandemonium and spreading fake news. Mm -hmm. The real news is scary enough mm -hmm. to me as it is um, without creating fake news and reasons for people not to take the real credible news seriously. Sure. Why is it called COVID-19? COVID-19 um, is the name that they gave because it is a coronavirus. So Corona starts out when you spell it C-O-R-O-N-A. Mm -hmm. So C-O mm -hmm. of COVID is for the coronavirus. V-I indicates virus okay. as opposed to bacteria. Um, D stands for disease. And then 19 is for 2019 because it was mm -hmm. first discovered in Wuhan, China, uh, in late December of 2019. And so COVID-19 is the name given to this specific strain of um, the coronavirus. I see. So on the coronavirus itself, the actual virus, where did this start and what, what are the symptoms? I mean, how would you know? Uh, well, it started in, they believe, it's believed that it started in Wuhan, China. Um, coronaviruses are, a, are, are viruses that um, humans have had before and continue to have from time to time. Coronaviruses are present in animals, but there are different strains. For example, a coronavirus that makes a dog sick mm -hmm. may not infect a cat and make a cat sick. And so kind of the rule of thought is they don't even know for certain because we're talking what, this disease is less than three months old. It's, it's truly in its infancy mm -hmm. in the human population. Um, the, the rule of thought kind of is that it originated in animals, quite possibly bats. Um, and so- In bats? Yeah, yes. Interesting. Yes, and so they think that it kind of made that leap to the human population. And um, now what we're seeing is people are testing positive for COVID-19 who have not traveled to any of the high risk areas. They haven't been around anybody who's been exposed and they're not sure when, where, or how they got it. And so that's called community spreading. And that is one of the three criteria um, for it to be labeled a pandemic. I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, Lisa Hauk, um, how, in your opinion, how does this differ from the common cold or the flu? Well, as far as symptoms, most of us are very familiar with the cold. You have a, typically a sore throat, sneezing, congestion, not always a fever associated with that. With the flu, you tend to have a very high fever and it hits you very abruptly where a cold may come on slowly. Um, and then you tend to have more aches and pains and fatigue with the flu. With COVID, it tends to strike pretty quickly once it hits and severe respiratory problems are the problem. You have cough, you have trouble, severe trouble breathing, shortness of breath, and you have a very high fever. So in the flu is very similar that you get hit very quickly with the high fever. So if you, you know, present that way, you need to be taking precautions for either. Sure. Now, uh, back to Lisa Sweet. Um, now that we kind of have a general idea of what that difference is between coronavirus and the common cold or the flu, how does one get tested and treated for this and how can you possibly not prevent spreading it? Right, right. Those are all um, really important and good questions. And um, as far as the National Association of Healthcare Assistants, our members work with the vulnerable population. Uh, COVID-19 is different from the flu in the fact that influenza is really hard on children. You guys probably have seen on the news how many children have died in your state from the flu. And so coronavirus, COVID-19, seems to not impact children as 
severely as it does people over age 50. Hmm. And, I, and I tend to say elderly people, but actually age 50 is kind of a, a cutoff in the, um, the, the risk factors for COVID-19. So the older you are, the, the greater risk that you're right. at. Um, and so when we're talking about long-term care, especially, or even home health and, or hospice, um, we're dealing with very vulnerable and susceptible people. And mm -hmm. whereas a younger person, such as yourself, yourself mm -hmm. who is healthy, you could probably contract COVID-19 and spread it. And well, we don't want you to spread it. No, <laughs> but you could probably contract COVID-19 and and recover from it. Some people, some people have very mild, if any, symptoms. But then 20% of the people have symptoms so severe that it takes over their lower respiratory tract and they end up with pneumonia. They end up on mechanical ventilation. They end up with multi-system organ failure. And like I said, it's, I've seen statistics anywhere from 16 to 20% of the people. And um, that's pretty scary when you start looking at some of those complications that can arise. Um, and if you have any doubt how it spreads, I have a little video it's not of an elderly person, it's of a, of a child, but um, this is spread by droplet infection. Okay. And those of us who have worked in long-term care, we have our annual end services, infection control, and there are a number of conditions that are spread by droplet infections, and in long-term care, we're used to isolating for those. And this short video shows you exactly the extent of how the droplets spray out and the CDC says that the droplets usually you want a range of safety of about six feet mm. but droplets can travel six feet mm -hmm. but I, I've also read that droplets can travel even up to 11 feet so can I ask a question what if the droplets land on the table and then you touch the table? Do they mm -hmm. stay alive on that table? Oh, yes. They, mm -hmm. Yes, they do. They stay alive on the inanimate surface. And depending on the sources that you read, uh, I have read that the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, can live as a fomite on the surface for anywhere from two hours to 11 hours. And then I've heard another couple of sources say it may even be a couple of days. Mm. So like I said, this is so new that there hasn't been a lot of research, ha hasn't been a lot of time, a lot of time. research okay. into it. And so, yes, you know, all we need, we don't even need to know how long, really. Right. I mean, that would be nice to know. But just knowing that those can be on a surface, um, I have a photo of a gentleman who is um, sneezing mm -hmm. and you can see the spray coming out of his mouth and that goes to show you a cough or a sneeze you're in the grocery store and makes you want to get the umbrella out mm -hmm. but um, you know that can travel for a great distance and so yes mainly what I have read and learned is that coronavirus is spreading mainly from person to person they really don't have any documented cases where a person has picked it up off of an inanimate object mm -hmm. as of yet but that's not to say that it couldn't happen and so one thing we all want to be certain to do is we want to uh, wipe down and disinfect high touch objects high touch objects you know coffee cups our cell phones mm. doorknobs telephone <laughs> doorknobs <laughs> toilets handles um anything that you touch sippy cups yes babies. keyboards mm -hmm. on computers and and tablets and things like that and so um yes disinfection can go a long way so specifically in long-term care um because a lot of our viewers are going to be in the long-term care spectrum uh, what should they look at specifically to prevent the spread, we, is there anything else that we should that we should tell nursing homes and nursing home staff to, to do differently to prevent or, to prevent spread. the spread? Absolutely. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, skilled nursing facilities in long term care are already starting 
some of the measures that are being recommended by the CDC and CMS. Mm -hmm. Some of them are restricting visitors, and some people think that that's horrible. But when you take into account that a visitor can be asymptomatic, have no symptoms, that they can be contagious, that's pretty frightening. Sure. Um, a lot of a lot of homes have gone to taking temperatures of visitors, so they'll know if they're running a fever, and if they're running a fever, they can't visit. And they're having them sign in with their information so that if they need to be notified down the road that they could have been exposed, they will have that information for that visitor. But, you know, they're screening employees, taking temps upon arrival to work. They're encouraging their employees to stay home if they're sick. They are ramping up their um, housekeeping and disinfection type methods. They are, a lot of homes are not having communal parties. They are keeping people in the rooms and doing more one-on-one -on -one activities so that they're not congregating all the people together so that if one of them's sick, hopefully they'll um, keep it minimized. They are closing the doors more often than just, you know, having the doors mm -hmm. open and things like that. Okay. Um, and use, well, proper hand washing is mm -hmm. probably number one. Mm -hmm. And then another good thing is um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer. It needs to be at least 60% alcohol hand sanitizer to be effective. Oh, that's a good number to know. Uh, Lisa Hauk, uh, mm -hmm. when, when is someone infectious? Well, I've pulled some data here mm -hmm. I wanted to share about that. Um, many of you are familiar with the cold and flu. Incubation for those is typically two days once someone is exposed to it. Um, with COVID, they're finding it's four plus days. So these are days you can be contagious and be spreading it to people and not know it. So when you talk about doubling the numbers of days of exposure, that's a scary number to me. Um, typically symptoms appear in two to 14 days. So if you're one of those 14 day people, you could honestly have two to two and a half weeks of exposing people. And they're finding in the flu, generally it's 1.2 people, somebody that has the flu infects. Mm -hmm. With COVID, they're finding that number is closer to 3.6. Mm. So one person, can affect almost four people. Mm -hmm. And the data that shows that is right now they're showing um, 100,000 people across the world mm -hmm. have COVID. The death rate is at 3.6%. It's 3,653 people that have died from COVID-19 across the world as of Monday morning. Mm -hmm. So those are scary numbers to me. So, and also when you think about deaths, from viruses to give you a comparison of how COVID might compare to the flu with deaths. Typically in the world, we have less than 1% of people die from the flu each year. And we're at 3.6% with COVID. So those are scary numbers and things that people really should be paying attention to. True, and when we're talking about vulnerable, vulnerable populations, death rates can be even higher than right. that. Right. Yeah, certain um, categories may be high and certain true, may be lower. True. Something that I would just like to, um, a couple of things I would like to touch on that we haven't talked about yet, mm -hmm. and I don't know, Dane, you may have these <laughs> questions, but um, um, one thing is the, um, I don't know how to uh, even describe it. There are some prejudices that are going on right now related to COVID-19. Um, there's from its origin. Pardon me. From its origin. From its origin, yes, because it it um, originated in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people who have been very discriminatory toward Asian people. Um, I saw in the news where some college students beat up an Asian kid in California. Oh, no. And that's the reason they listed was COVID-19. Mm. And uh, we have to be smart about this. The, we cannot discriminate against anybody. It is only going to cause greater spread mm -hmm. of the virus. And that is a very ignorant way of thinking. Um, Everybody has to support one another, and that's the only way that we're going to really halt this is by everybody working together. Um, it's not you're not going to do anything by beating somebody up. The average person, 
if you're healthy, don't go out and buy three cases of face masks because <laughs> right. what happens? Yeah. Yes, what happens when you're doing that is you're running the supply so low that healthcare workers, those of us who work in nursing homes and hospitals, aren't going to have the supplies that we need to take care of the people that um, are the contagious. Sick. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. and so um, there are a lot of things that we're doing right now that we can stop doing in my opinion and those are just a couple of of the things that well, and i also think that one of the other things is we need to fact check we need uh, we need yes. to fact check yes. because it is a there's been something that's going around the news that or around social media that Corona, the beer has actually dropped in stock, <laughs> oh. and that is not true at all. It has beer is to do doing with just if, if that was in fact the case, then I would be very scared for our society. Uh, but no, I think that it is absolutely mm -hmm. essential that in this day and age, we we must fact check everything that we see because we don't actually know. So what you bring up there, Lisa, is actually a very, 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 very valid point. Fear and anxiety makes people do things they normally wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Sure, people who normally wouldn't. Um, discriminate against certain people might be swayed by the fear and anxiety and that's no that's still no excuse mm -hmm. but fear and anxiety fake news mm -hmm. all of that contributes to this kind of thing and it just contributes to the chaos and we don't need panic and we don't need chaos we need to be sensible about this I am amazed that there's so many people on Facebook who think hand washing is a new thing. Um, <laughs> those of us who work in healthcare are so used to washing our hands that it comes naturally many times. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, we just need to be smart about it, and we need to be diligent, and you know, wash our hands, avoid exposure to sick people if you can help it. If you're taking care of sick people, wear the personal protective equipment, the PPE wear it according to the instructions because you know what if you're wearing ppe and it's not according to instructions it might not be effective it's like as a new parent mm -hmm. dane's got a fairly well he's got a young <laughs> got one what? okay what happens when you bring your baby home and you put the diaper on but you don't put it on right you ever have them pee down their leg right down the leg. Yep. Yep. Right down the leg. And you have mm -hmm. to change pajamas yep. and everything yep. yeah Yes. Well, it's not, you can't just use a product. You have to use a product, a, a product according to the directions and the instructions. Read the directions. Yes. And directions. so, yes, that goes through any, in, from a face mask to eye shields. Mm -hmm. And because it is droplet, if you're taking care of someone who has it, you're going to want to protect any orifice that has mucous membranes. Mm -hmm. And that includes your eyes, your mouth, your nose. Yes. Mm -hmm. So really one of the main scares is just the fact that we don't really know. That's probably one of the biggest things. So one, my very opening question was, is this a big deal or are people just overreacting? And th the reason why we have this reaction, whether it's overreaction or not, mm -hmm. it's mostly because we don't really know what it is and what we just know that we have data that shows that it's highly that it's potentially highly dangerous yes is that correct yes. lisa yes okay yeah um so lisa how um mm -hmm. have we you mentioned the flu mm -hmm. and i think that was very great data have we seen anything like this before um are there are there any past pandemics that look like this are they similar to this yes and no there have been many pandemics over the centuries uh, most of them have been flu related some version of the flu. We all have heard the Spanish flu recently from the early 1900s. Um, H1N1. Yes, H1N1. There's, there's always variations on the flu. And I feel we're going to have the same thing with COVID. We may have COVID-19 this year. What are we going to have next year? Because chances are it will mutate at some point and become a new disease. So just like the flu, though, we will work through it, we will work through the data, we will learn about it, and we will come up with a vaccine to help people and hopefully come up with a treatment that will be effective to help people. When can we expect a vaccine? I think you're looking at a year to a year and a half for the U.S. to produce a vaccine. Um, there are several other countries that are also working on vaccines, so if they get it done more quickly and then are willing to share that with us, we may get it faster, but I would, I would say at least a year. Lisa, sweet last word. Um, is it possible for the virus to decline during the summer months and come back stronger in the fall or winter? Is that, is that a thing? 
you know, I've thought about that and I've done a little bit of research on it. And the truth is we really don't know because this is a brand new disease in humans and it's unpredictable. And um, from that respect, only time will tell. Um, I do want to say that according to the CDC website, if you have symptoms of COVID-19 coronavirus and the cardinal symptoms that they want to look at are fever and it's usually high fever, 103 degrees or over fever, uh, shortness of breath, coughing and fatigue. Those are the four cardinal symptoms. If you think you have COVID-19, if you've been exposed to COVID-19 or traveled from an area that has it. If you think you have it, don't run out and go to the emergency room unless you're in a life-threatening condition. You need to, as soon as you start symptoms, contact your healthcare practitioner or your county health department and they will make arrangements to get you tested. If you have symptoms, and you think you might have it and you have to go to your doctor's office, call your doctor's office ahead of time, tell them you think you might have it because that way it will allow them to get other patients and other staff members out of the get prepared area for you to come. so that if you do have it, you're not exposing everyone. And so, like I said, um, yes, it's frightening. Yes, I think it's a big deal. CNAs are awesome people. They know infection control. Yes, they, they know do. how to break the chain of infection. And so I think that by everyone staying um, uh, very diligent to uh, hand hygiene and cough hygiene, you know, I think that this can be brought under control, but it's going to take everybody being sensible and working together. Same. And if you want to fact check, cdc.gov, cms.gov. cdc.gov and cms.gov. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa Haug. Thank you, Lisa Sweet. I really yeah. do appreciate it. Everybody, please uh, comment, share. Uh, thank you again to Northern Light Health for sponsoring this video. And we'll see you next time.